you guys for coming out. It's a beautiful Wednesday. It's a beautiful Wednesday. Um, you could be a lot of different places now, but you're here. It's great. And um, so, as David said, my name is Boyan. Um, first shout out to David for setting all this up and uh, all the help. You guys are awesome. Um, I'm the CTO of a biometric security company called Hyper. We're based here in New York City. And I'm going to be talking about a topic that's becoming more and more popular, and it's about biometric security and using biometrics to access things rather than things like passwords or two-factor tokens or SMS messages and such things. So um, after the presentation, I'm going to be giving a really quick demo, and I'd love to get your opinion on it. So why are we here? Why am I talking about this? Why did I you know, help start this company? Um, I'm here because our existing ways of answering am I who I say I am are really terrible. And this is because of many reasons. Um, we use passwords and we use have solutions built on top of passwords and 76% of breaches bypass these implementations. And we're not doing a very good job of it in general. Uh, as, a, as a species in general, we've only been doing um, security of data for like 60 years, really, when you think about it. Uh, we've been doing physical security for like thousands of years. So we're, ver we're very new at this, and um, we need better solutions. So let's look at some authentication failures uh, that we've seen in the recent years. Um, passwords clearly don't work. Uh, as you know, these are the most common passwords of last year. Um, there are a lot of two-factor security solutions that work different ways. Um, RSA tokens, um, you know, SMS messages, two-factor applications. Um, but a lot of them are either bypassed by malware or some other sophisticated attack, um, and they simply just don't work. So um, we keep adding layers and layers and layers on top of things, and um, they're not doing the trick. So why am I talking by, about biometrics, and why am I talking about them now? Um, typically, when you think about biometrics, you think about things like James Bond movies and etc., and where you know, there's somebody using a palm print or a retina scanner or something, and these things have existed in the past, and they've been pretty effective, but they've been extremely expensive at the same time. So you usually only see them in really fancy government implementations or um, really, really nice tech companies, things like that. So what's happening nowadays is Companies like Qualcomm, Intel, ARM, they're creating chips that are specifically meant for biometrics. And they're doing this now because we have the technology and it's cheap enough. And companies like Samsung and Apple, they're actually putting biometrics into their phones and laptops. Uh, so if you look at the, um, most people in here probably have an iPhone with a fingerprint meter, or you have some sort of Galaxy S6 or S5 phone with a fingerprint meter. Um, and then what's also happening is all these companies that make operating systems are integrating with these biometrics that are being deployed. So we have Windows 10, Android M, iOS, all have integrations with biometrics. And it's said before the end of next year, a billion people on the planet will have biometrics accessible to them, which is really great. So before we talk about using biometrics for authentication, let's talk about the rules for biometrics for authentication, right? It has to be better than what we already have. So what are these rules? Well, first, it has to be secure, right? You shouldn't be able to access something unless you're me. That's first and foremost. Second, it has to be really simple and really convenient. If it's not easy to use, if it's not easy to do, the everyday people aren't going to use it. My dad isn't going to use something unless it's simple. Third, it has to be interoperable. So you have to be able to use the same technology to access everything on all things. So whether it's your laptop, your mobile phone, uh, whatever it may be, it has to work the same. 
four, it has to ensure your privacy. So it has to make sure that your personal information stays secure and safe. And it has to make sure that nobody else can get to that. So how do you do that when you're talking about biometrics, right? And the last, and this is strictly applicable to biometrics um, more than other things, it has to be revocable. So what I, mean, what I mean by that is I can change my password whenever I feel like it. But I can't change my fingerprint or my retina or my face that easily. Right, so it has to be revocable. So let's talk about how biometrics works, using biometrics for authentication works in um, this new world of biometric devices becoming widely available. So a user goes to a login terminal, whether it's on their laptop, their desktop, or their mobile phone. So the first thing that happens is their biometric authenticator, whatever it may be, it could be their iPhone, it could be their Samsung, Samsung phone, it could be their new Windows 10 machine, it gets issued a challenge token. And the user has to verify their biometric identity. Now when you verify your biometric identity by providing your fingerprint or your face or your eye or whatever, it, it, this initializes a cryptographic signature. So you have a cryptographic signature that occurs on the authenticator and the challenge token gets signed with a private key. That signature get, then gets passed to a server-side validator. The server-side validates the signature with the corresponding public key and then we know it's you. And the reason we know it's you is because the only way that you can initiate that signature is if you provide the correct biometric. So let's talk about ways that um, this conforms with the rules that we mentioned earlier. So is it secure? Yes, it's secure because you can't uh, authorize that signature unless you're me. Is it simple? Yes, it's simple because I'm not typing in a 16 character password that I'm also going to use everywhere else. Um, what were the other things? It, it is interoperable, so you can use the same system on a bunch of different devices that have biometrics, and a billion people will have these, so it's interoperable. It's privacy ensuring, right, because your biometric data never actually leaves your biometric authenticator. So this is important because when you think about password-based authentication and other types of similar solutions, we have this central repository of everybody's passwords, right? So what that creates is a really lucrative target for a lot of hackers. So when you store a bunch of really sensitive data in one central place, people are going to go after that. So what we do is we decentralize people's identities so that this authentication happens. It gets initiated on your biometric, such as your phone, and you no longer have this mass storage of people's, bio, of people's data in a centralized repository. So, therefore, it's privacy ensuring. The only information that actually gets stored on the server side of things are public keys. And those are public, and um, we don't care if somebody else has them. And how is it revocable? Right, so this was the key thing with biometrics. How do you revoke access to somebody's biometric? Well, since the public key is what verifies that user's identity by verifying that signature, um, all you have to do is revoke that public key. You don't actually have to revoke that person's biometric, just the public key. So that's that. Um, so what the heck do we do at our company? Uh, we make this possible for other companies. So if you're using password-based authentication or two-factor-based solutions, now you can use biometrics um, as they become available and they're becoming widely available. So we build client-side SDKs that you can implement on your applications, on your login terminals, etc. We provide the verification servers that are either SaaS or on-premise. So, um, and these just work off of a simple REST API. Uh, we also integrate with things like Active Directory and Radius. And last but not least, we actually provide a biometric token, which we created ourselves. Um, so I'll show this to you. So this 
So we created this thing. Um, it's a token. It goes on a keychain or in your pocket or wherever. And it's got a fingerprint reader on it, and it's Bluetooth. So it talks to, for example, my laptop here. Um, it talks to any device that I need biometric security for. And what this allows you to do, what this allows you to do is have a biometric authenticator that you can use in your company or wherever uh, today, uh, without having to wait for biometrics to be um, to reach a million people. So this is particularly useful for financial services, healthcare, um, government applications, where you need full control of devices, and you may not necessarily trust consumer-focused devices uh, that are available to, us, to consumers. So we built some fancy stuff into this, like uh, tamper resistance. If you try to open it, it wipes the data, all that information. Your biometric information never leaves this device. Um, it's strictly used for um, authenticating you to this device and then issuing a biometric signature. So that's what we do. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. For me to access, let's say you have an iPhone, right, and you're using it to log into things. I take a picture of your thumb, and for me to log into your uh, PayPal account on your iPhone, now I have to have your iPhone first. Okay. And then I also have to manage to lift your fingerprint and do that. Now, if I want, let's say I want to do that for a million people, right? I have to go from person to person to person to do this. Whereas with passwords, I have to go to one database that control that has a million passwords and have to hack it. Now, if you're a hacker, which one would you go after first? I would go from man to middle. So the penetrate the child. Which one happens to you? And there are certain, a lot of controls to prevent that. So certificate attestation, uh, channel binding, a lot of things. So I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Um, so I'm going to do a demo. Uh, we're also doing a lot of evaluations. So if you're interested in doing one, let me know. Uh, so in this demo, I'm going to show how I log into my American Express account using my biometric token. Right. So my laptop here does not have a um, biometric reader on it because it's a Mac Pro, but I have this token that has a fingerprint reader, so I'm going to use it to access <coughs> my American Express account. So when I go to American Express, my computer is going to realize that I'm connected to it over Bluetooth using my token. Okay? And I have this option here to log in with the biometric login. I'm going to say I want to use my hyper token to log in. Now, when I press this button, I'm going to swipe my finger on this token, and I'm going to gain access to my account. So I press the button. I swipe my fingerprint. And I log in. So that's how I access my American Express account from now on. I don't worry about managing passwords. I don't worry about making sure I change it every three months. I don't worry about any of that. And American Express doesn't have to worry about me doing any of that. So. so I, have me like, I have a question. You, you might have to skip this for the time, but how do you prevent from somebody being in the middle, like doing a replay attack? Like, they pretend that I'm American Express. They try to log into your American Express, but they got a challenge from American Express. They send it to you. I would assume you guys tackle this problem, just mention it. Yeah, absolutely. So the question is, how do you prevent man-in-the-middle attacks in this scenario? So there are a lot of opportunities here for man-in-the-middle attacks. There's the Bluetooth connection from my token to my laptop, and there's the HTTPS connection from my laptop to the American Express server. Right. So how do you prevent man-in-the-middle there? Well, first of all, the challenge token that is issued is only valid for so many seconds. So you have to execute this attack in that period of time. Now, we'll, let's say you bypass that. Well, there are certain there are certain metadata that gets included in this cryptographic signature, and this metadata gets passed from my biometric token, and additional metadata gets included along the way. So as this message travels, as the signature travels from my token to my laptop up to the server, there are various pieces of, of information that get gathered along the way and they all get verified on the server side. Now, if you do a man in the middle and you're not able to 
gather every single piece of information along the way, you don't succeed at this attack. And keep in mind that it still has to be done within that time frame. So that is that is some of the mitigation that there is in this place. Just out of curiosity, against what are you authenticating actually? Is it against American Express? Is Americans Express doing the authentication or do you have something in the we have a server that we deploy that actually does the authentication. And how does the server communicate to American Express? It's we have so the server gets deployed either on a SaaS model or on premise. Okay. I won't say which. Okay. So no, it doesn't store the password. There is no password. Okay. We just uh, incorporated this into an existing login screen. What happens if you don't have access to the internet company? You go onto a laptop at a company. The question is, what happens if you don't have Bluetooth? And that's a great example. So, one of the things that we're building into this token, um, it's already engineered actually, is NFC. So, if you use NFC, that's fine. But let's say you don't even have that, right? Most Windows 10 laptops that are coming out come with. Um, a camera that's specifically built for biometric authentication. And it's meant to, uh, it's, it does biometric authentication using facial recognition. And so you can use that in place. Um, or if you have an iPhone in your pocket with a fingerprint reader, you can use that, or a Samsung S5 S6, or any of the other 20 phones that are coming out with biometrics over the next 18 months. So I'm logging up to my Get my bank account information. I can use my phone to get that information on my computer. Precisely. How is that going to be connected? The same way that your browser is connected to your your application provider service. Right, you provide your username. Let's say I want to log in as Boyan to this service. My service knows that I have a biometric phone that I've already registered with that service, and it sends down the notification to authenticate with my fingerprint. Same way. What if it's what? Then you have to either register another device. It's the same as if you lost your credit card number, for example. Sorry, another question. Like, what is the difference between your device and Apple iPhone apps? Yeah. What is the difference between this and an iPhone? Yeah. So, this is meant to be used in applications where you do not trust consumer-focused devices. And there are many of those. But at that point of time when I need such specific device, this means like I'm, I'm really targeting like high net value people, then I would come to the effort of trying to get their fingerprints again. So basically I would say like, if it's really high net value, and that's why I make dedicated devices, then I would try to, to scrap their fingerprints. So you have to scrap their fingerprint and have the device, yeah. which is difficult. But the way that we deploy this technology is we say, hey, use biometric authentication to access things. Now if you want to use additional measures, additional controls on top of that, that's up to you. Perfect. But for us, and I think many people would agree, is that typically when you add security to things, you reduce usability. And we don't want to do that. We want to, we want to improve security and improve usability. And that's, that's what we think we've done.